Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. And we believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday at 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Well, good morning and welcome to Covenant Church. If you're a guest, a special welcome to you. My name is Patrick, and I'm the pastor here at Covenant. You know, we believe that God is three in one. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is unity in the diversity, and it's the same with us. We gather from different ages and different neighborhoods, different vocations and, and backgrounds. There's a diversity, and yet there's a unity and that we're called here by God the Father and redeemed by the Son. Our eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit. So in that posture, would you stand, if you would, as we encourage each other today through our singing and praying and reading, and also we worship the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I will do the leader portion and invite you all just to read aloud and let your voices be heard by each other as we call each other into worship, Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Father, we praise you this morning. All your works, they praise you. All of creation praises you today. A thousand tongues times a thousand tongues times a thousand tongues declare your glory, and so do we. And we pray all this in the strong name of Christ. Amen.
stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stay you stood before Could I?
Lord, we do stand in awe of what you have done for us. Lord, your life, your death, your resurrection. Lord, how you have given us a heart of flesh in the place of a heart of stone. Lord, we thank you for the life that we have this morning together in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll invite you to go ahead and have a seat. I was recently reminded of a quote that I appreciate. It has stuck with me. You may have heard it. Everyone wants a revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. That could be applied in a lot of different directions, but I actually think it helps us as we turn our attention now. We've just sung about completely offering our lives to God. And those are powerful words and good words that we can make with a beautiful noise, and yet we still have to do it. And so I think the prayer of confession is actually an opportunity for us to do it. The quote that I um, just shared with you, I found in a book by Tish Harrison Warren called The Liturgy of the Ordinary. It's a great book. And she talks about being a Christian who longs for revolution, who longs for things to be made new and whole and beautiful in big ways. But she's slowly seeing that you can't get to the revolution without learning how to do the dishes. And the kind of spiritual life and disciplines that are needed to sustain the Christian life are actually quiet, repetitive, ordinary, small. She admits wanting to skip the boring stuff, the daily stuff, and get to the thrill of an edgy faith. But it's the dailiness of the Christian faith the making the bed, the doing the dishes, the praying for our enemies, the reading the Bible, the quiet, the small, that's how God transforms us, how that transformation takes root and grows. So every week we practice this discipline of confession and we do it for relational reasons. We do it because we are in a relationship with God that he has already loved us and given us life as we've just sung. And so we're invited to do life with him, and this is an act of weeding out the sin that so easily entangles us and providing good soil and room for God's good gifts, for his work, the work of his spirit to bear fruit. So this is a practice of tending our soil or tending our relationship with God. So I'm going to give you a moment to read over the prayer of confession that is printed in your worship handout. Or up on the screen. And then I'm going to invite us to read this together, that together with our voices out loud, reading this together, that we see we're not alone in this. We are most certainly joined with brothers and sisters in this together. Please pray with me. God of grace, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. By our actions and our attitudes, we praise what you condemn. Help us to admit our sin, so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Take a moment now to just spend in prayer before the Lord, thinking on this prayer of confession, thinking on what Christ has done for us. And hear these words of encouragement, these words of life from Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. I realize these may be familiar to some of you, so open your ears and your minds and receive this good news. For it is by grace that you have been saved 
through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Lord, we thank you for this good news. We realize that there's bad news, that we need help, that we are not okay on our own. And yet, Lord, you are so quick to open your arms to us, to welcome us as we are, and to give us life. Not because of anything that we've done, Lord, but as a gift. So help us to open this good news, this gift, this morning. Pray that we would be encouraged right now, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would give us courage and hope and peace, knowing that we are your sons and daughters, adopted and chosen and dearly loved. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we need to do the dishes, and there is revolutionary truth in following Jesus. And so we get to now, together, stand. I'm going to invite you to stand, and I'm going to even talk while you're standing, sorry. But we get to say the Apostles' Creed together. And I think sometimes we get this backwards, and this part might feel like you're doing the dishes, because it can feel strange to read and to say something in unison together. It's a unique uh, practice that we do. But this is the revolutionary part. This is the truth that people throughout church history have given their lives to defend and given their lives and belief of. So I'm going to invite us. Um, not that we have to shout it or be revolutionary, but just realizing the weight of the truth that we get to say together because it is true and it's impacted and shaped each of our lives. So join with me as we declare the essentials of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
our Lord and our God, we have poetically sung our prayers to you just now. And each of us pray that it's not just flattering words, but that it is a pouring out of our soul to you. A desire to commit our lives to you, to do your will, to glorify your name, to see your kingdom come in this world. We thank you by your spirit that we can do just that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Now is the opportunity for the elementary students to go in the back, meet your teachers, and it's also an opportunity for the rest of us who remain to uh, get to know somebody that you perhaps don't know that well seated next to you. I invite you all to go ahead and find your seats once again. Thank you for greeting one another so well. Uh, my name is Kennerly. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm on staff here at Covenant, and I want to draw your attention to a few announcements. Um, I even have a mystery announcement that's not on the front of your handout, so we'll see if you can catch which one it is. So um, we have a few things coming up in June, and I'm actually going to go in reverse order, reverse chronological order. There's not a word for that. So. Starting with June 12th, we have a congregational meeting coming up. So this is a meeting that we have that everyone is welcome to, but especially voting members, we encourage you to come because we have this meeting once a year, and it's a way to reflect back on where God has been at work and to celebrate that, and also to look forward at what's ahead, um, plans, uh, so the finances, the budget, and new officers, new elders and deacons, we get to vote to approve all those things. So I invite you to come again, right? Everyone wants a revolution. No one wants to do the dishes. I hope you're not thinking the congregational meeting's dishes, um, but I hope to see you there. Um, it's a really neat time of reflecting on God's goodness um, backwards and forwards. On June 5th, so we're moving up in time. June 5th, which is coming up, there is the Rock and Roll Marathon going on in San Diego. And if you have been here for that, you know things look a little different around our neighborhood. It's very fun because runners get to go straight through North Park. And uh, it's, it's a fun um, activity. However, we don't want it to be uh, a hindrance to you for getting to church. Most of the road openings are open. Most of the road closures open by 10 a.m., but I'm sure you're aware we start at 10, so that doesn't solve your problem. There is a map. You can go on the Rock and Roll website. You can also find the map if you get our weekly email. If you don't, please see me or sign up for that. There's helpful things in there. And uh, so there is a map that you can check out on the best way to get here, but I'm going to give you the best way to get here. I'm simplifying it for you. We'll see if I can not look at my notes and remember. So depending on what direction you're coming from, if you come from 8 and exit on Texas, take Texas to Howard. Howard's straight out there. That is the best way to get here because there are no road closures at all. So 8 to ha Texas to Howard. Uh, so just drawing it to your attention. You can also just leave extra time, park far away, and walk. That's a great <laughs> option. Um, so here's our mystery announcement that we're going to try something new, and I'm very excited about. Um, I think I'll call it Picnic in the Park. And everyone is welcome. We're going to gather like three times over the summer on a Saturday morning at a park nearby. Everyone is welcome. And it's a BYOP, which means bring your own picnic. So if you want a blanket to sit on, bring it. If you want a chair to sit on, bring it. Games, 
all of it's welcome. Whatever you think sounds fun, bring it because the friends will be provided. I will bring donuts. And it's really just another opportunity for us to get to know each other, to relate. Sundays can be busy and we can be scattered and going in different directions. So another location, another time, another space for us to gather as God's family. So more information will be coming. The first one will be June 4th. June 4th. So more dates, more information, but just wanted to draw your attention to that. Uh, we also have two things that are happening every Sunday. So every Sunday we have food that happens magically outside as you leave. And I love seeing how uh, we're able to just have some time and space to gather to enjoy some snacks and, each, and conversation with each other. So to make that happen, there are folks who are uh, setting up and cleaning up and providing that. Now, I know some of you think of food and hospitality more as your spiritual gift. You're really good at it. And others of you may think of it more as a spiritual discipline. I just want you to know all are welcome. Whether it is a gift or a discipline, you would be welcome on this team. It's called the hospitality team, which might be one of the nicest sounding teams to be a part of. So if you would like to be a part of that, you can um, contact me and I will maybe give you a hug and be excited. So uh, we also have covenant classes and those are happening before this worship time, 845. They're upstairs where the kids are. You go up. You'll look for me. I'll be standing in the doorway. These have been a really amazing time, I think, of transformation. There's a really neat group that has uh, been gathering in these times, praying together and learning together and handling very heavy and important revolutionary truths. And so we have just, I think, a wealth of insight and Christian life experience that is gathering and praying and learning together in that time. So we would love to have you a part of that. And it's, I think, a really neat resource for equipping us in the conversations that we all are having with friends and family who have questions about the Christian faith, about what we believe and why we believe it. And it's, uh, it's helpful for us to have answers because we have a reasonable faith. And so to have answers for those important questions um, is a good thing. And it's even better when it's done with friends. So just drawing your attention to that covenant class time that is happening. With that, I am going to pray for our community now. Lord, just as we think about the things that are coming up in our community, everything from a congregational meeting to um, the rock and roll marathon, Lord, we thank you that you care about these details of our lives, the logistics of our daily lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be good stewards of the resources that you've given us, both our time and our energy, our money, our gifts. Lord, we thank you that you've equipped us You've given us life and enabled us to live a life that is pleasing to you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to do that. We pray that for ourselves as a church community, that we would be a church that bears your light and shines brightly your truth and your love in our neighborhood. And we pray that for us as individuals, as we go out into our various fields and areas of responsibility, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in the small and the daily tasks, Lord, that we would see your goodness and celebrate, Lord, the truth and the reality of being your children. So we thank you, Lord, for the reason that we gather this morning and also the reason that we scatter then throughout this week, Lord, of being united together with brothers and sisters as your church. We thank you for this new family. And we pray, Lord, now that you would prepare our hearts and minds for hearing your word, both read and proclaimed. Lord, we thank you that you have spoken. You spoke creation into existence, and you speak this morning to us through your word. I pray for Kevin as he preaches. I pray for Julie as she reads. Lord, help us to receive, to listen, and to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I am going to invite Julie up now for our scripture reading. Good morning. 
Good morning. So our reading today is from Galatians 5, 16 through 26 from the NIV. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Kevin Kyle. Um, I am an evangelical Presbyterian church pastor. Um, I actually have to tell you that because I'm a Navy chaplain. So when Navy chaplains get up to speak, they have to give you the denomination that they are a part of. It's been beaten, I'm sorry, ingrained <laughs> into me. So I have to share that with you. Uh, I am from Richmond, Virginia. I'm actually uh, ordained by the Presbytery of the James at Hope Church. And so when my wife and I, this is uh, my first time being an active duty Navy chaplain, uh, and, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with you for multiple reasons. One, I didn't have to shave today. It's a, it's a big deal for those of us that are military personnel. You get that, right, personally. Um, but also, coming to California is difficult because we, we leave everything that we have known. My wife is from Maine. I'm from Virginia. We call ourselves a little bit of New Englanders. We love cold weather. And so now we're in California where it's Groundhog Day every day. It's just the same thing. It's, it's awesome. We like it a lot. Uh, but it's a joy to know that even, uh, even if we're away from our church or away from our home, to be here has been, in a sense, a second home. To know that this is almost the same body of believers and to engage in worship and things like that is incredible. And so Patrick asked me to speak on the fruit of the Spirit today. You know, nothing big, just an exhaustive list of things that all of us want to talk about, and I have 20 minutes to do it. So if I don't hit something, blame him, okay? Don't blame me. So as I was preparing for this passage, um, it struck me how much God loves gardens. Um, I, need, I, I need to say one thing, well, two things before we move on. You don't know me and I don't know you, so I want us to have a little bit of a relationship build here. Uh, there's two things that I'm going to do today. One, you're seeing right now, I move. So if you are not accustomed to quick movements, it might not be the sermon for you. I might even duck. We don't even know what's going to happen up here. Second, um, I have a positive correlation to the loudness of my voice and how excited I get about preaching to you. So if I'm yelling at you, it means I love you. Okay, uh, I'm practicing for when our kids are born, right? We can actually work on that. But it struck me how much God loves gardens. The garden imagery is everywhere in Scripture. I mean, if, if we start with the beginning, right, we have the Garden of Eden in Genesis. We have this entire story about how we're created, what our relationship was like, how that relationship was broken, and it all centers around a garden, if we move to the book of Exodus, um, pomegranates were, ordain were uh, uh, adorning the uh, fabric and the uh, robes of the priests. They actually were also covering the uh, columns of Solomon's temple, of the temple that was in Jerusalem. There's this vineyard language and imagery that we see throughout Scripture. Jesus he continues this imagery in these parables about the kingdom of God, right? We can think of a couple, the seed and the sower, the farmer who sows seeds and someone comes and sows weeds, hiring workers at a vineyard, there's like two or three of those, 
right? And then he even goes so far in John 15 to say that he, Jesus himself, is the vine. We are the branches, and God is the vine dresser or the gardener. So it's pretty safe for us to say that God likes gardens. And even so, he wants us to know that he likes them. I heard a cool definition of uh, illustrations and parables once. It said this, illustrations, um, images throughout scripture, parables, what they really are, are invitations from God to his character and his kingdom. Images, illustrations, parables are invitations to the character of God and the kingdom of God. Now, if we use an example, let's look at the creation story real quick, right? Like we said, this is the story of how things came to be, and it takes place in a garden, the personal relationship with God as a gardener in the garden. Sin leads to exclusion from the garden, right? We have sin, the separation, the broken relationship, and upon the release of sin, all of life is a journey of going back to our original relationship with God in where? The garden, I wonder if this was God's intent when he would mention this type of imagery or story to his people. Maybe he was inviting us back into the character of God and the kingdom that he made. Got fat fingers, so flipping these pages can be a little difficult. So I kind of have two experiences with gardening growing up. Uh, One, uh, my dad tried growing gardens in Virginia. The soil that we had was clay, so like not soil. But he did manage to grow some stuff. And one year, uh, he grew nothing but zucchinis. (laughs) And for the whole summer, we had zucchinis every day. Um, The last time that I had a zucchini was yesterday by accident. Because if I knew that it was a zucchini, I was not going to have that zucchini from the PTSD of the summer of zucchinis, the zucchini summer in my high school year. The other interaction that I had with the garden was my wife. Now, on my wife's side of the family, all of them garden, her grandparents, her parents, her aunts, her uncles. And when we were able to move up to Maine, we got to become gardeners. Um, I got to use a tractor. I sang so many country songs. It was incredible. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was sounding on point. But you, uh, when you look at gardening, you till, you plow the land, you plant seeds. We set up this really cool irrigation system that really didn't work, but it was cool, right? And you kind of think to yourself, like when you're in school and you plant a seed and, and then you just go home and like nothing happens, you come back and plants are coming. That's not how it works. The real work of gardening for my gardeners out there is the everyday consistent effort of nurturing the seed. You got to water it every day. You got to pull weeds almost every day. There's this thing in Maine, I don't know if we have it in California yet, it's called frost, you know? And sometimes the temperature will be so cold that the morning dew will frost and it'll choke out the plant. So at 11 o'clock at night, here I am in my jammy jams, right? Going in this garden with all of my mason jars and Tupperware containers covering the plants so they don't get frost and they don't die. Fending off predators. Took a lot of teamwork. We couldn't do this ourselves, right? And I kept asking myself, like, was it worth it? Well, when I had that watermelon, yes. Yes, it was worth it. As we look at this passage today, we're not going to dig into what these individual fruits are. Like I told you, I've only got 20 minutes, okay? And I know I'm going to go over it. But in all reality, there isn't, there isn't some spiritual definition or nuance about joy, love, peace, patience that I could give you that would somehow radically change your life. And to be blunt, that's not the point of this passage. The fruits of the Spirit aren't really what we need to be focusing on. What I want to leave us with today and what I think God wants us to see about the Holy Spirit is his invitation to nurture what has been planted. See, this passage actually has little to do with the fruits and more to do about where they're from. It's an invitation into the character of God and the kingdom of God. 
So let's dig into it a little bit. If you're a Bible opening person, you can open it up to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, I think we might even have it on here. If we don't, then that was my failure, not them, okay? Don't blame them for that. But I'm going to read just a little bit of this. You uh, have it in your, in your uh, handout as well. Before we start, a little bit of background. So we're in Galatians, and there's a problem going on in the churches in Galatia. Specifically, it's a problem between Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians. Now, uh, when I say that, what I mean is people that converted to Christianity that were ethnically um, Jewish and then people that weren't, Gentiles, right? Uh, And so what was happening were the Jewish Christians were trying to enforce um, traditional Jewish rabbinical laws that did not apply in terms of the gospel. Things like circumcision, other things like that, um, certain foods that you should eat, certain rituals that you should practice. And it was causing this intense division in the churches throughout Galatia. Now, Paul hears about this and uh, he gets fired up. And he writes this letter uh, basically condemning that and uh, making sure there's an understanding of what it is that really makes us clean. What is it that really brings us into a holy relationship with God? And here, Paul is talking about sanctification. Simply defined, sanctification is the process by which we are made holy. This is a daily process where we day by day, are transformed by the Holy Spirit until our completion. And our completion uh, comes from our physical death on this earth or the second coming of, of Jesus. This is just a simplistic definition of what sanctification is. And he's arguing this point, and he puts the division between following the flesh or following the Spirit. So let's look at the first couple of verses. Paul says this, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Let's stop Right there. So here we have this division between the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Now, division kind of makes sense because if these are different fruits, they're not on the same tree, are they? If we keep playing with that imagery, um, you know a tree by its fruit. You're not going to plant an apple tree and have pears show up. There's some biological engineer somewhere that's going, well, we can do that now. It's the 21st century. Well, not in this time, right? (laughs) You know trees by their fruit. They produce a specific thing, and these things are divided. But not only that, they're opposed to one another. They're against, they're at war with each other. So here's the divide that we have. We either live and die according to the flesh, or we live according to the Spirit. Now, why does he say in verse 18, under the law? Well, context Right, We're talking about Jewish Christians and non-Jewish Christians and Jewish Christians putting rabbinical laws that shouldn't apply on these people. He actually says uh, a couple of verses earlier where this huge division is actually where people, where Christians are biting and devouring one another. That sounds like a terrible time to live in, doesn't it? where uh, Christians are dividing themselves because of certain practices that they believe is important that the other one doesn't seem to follow? That doesn't sound like today at all, does it? Kevin, that's a sermon for another time. Okay, we're going to just leave that there and go past that. But seriously, I mean, why does, why does he say not being under the law? You don't have to turn with me. I'm going to read this here for you. But if we go to some of Paul's other writings in Romans chapter 8, he's explaining this process in terms of what the law does and how it applies to the flesh. He says this in Romans 8, starting at verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
So there's this common uh, phrase in Paul's vernacular, the law makes us aware of sin and we are powerless to fulfill it. He makes connections in trying to live by the law. Here's a little, here's a little graphic. The law equals flesh, which equals sin, which equals death. This is kind of the imagery that Paul is trying to get us to see. The law equals sin, equals flesh, equals death. And what he's saying was, that was complete. That was complete by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you are in all reality, church, trying to accomplish what has already been given to you by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He even goes so far to say, that Abraham was justified by faith, not by the law. When Abraham was walking around and walking in righteousness with God, the law didn't exist. It wasn't written down. Moses hadn't been born yet. None of that stuff had happened. So how could he be righteous apart from the law? Well, because faith is what makes you righteous, not the law. There's so much in there, and I would encourage you to read it because I've only got 20 minutes. That's my last joke on that one. Okay, Patrick, I promise. So the point so far... We've got the flesh, and we've got the spirit. They're opposed to one another, and we have to choose one. And then we get these lists. We look at verse 19, and we see the acts of the flesh, 22, the fruit of the spirit. What I really love is he gives these exhaustive lists, and in verse 21, um, I just love the and the like. You know, he's kind of putting like an etc. You know what I'm talking about. These are the things, right? And then he hits the division home a little bit more, where he says, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Oh, sorry, that's verse 19. Uh, those who live like this, verse 21, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why are these bad? If you look at these things right here, what is it about them that causes them to be living in the flesh that leads to death? This may sound simple, but sometimes simple doesn't mean shallow. Simple can actually mean really deep. These are bad because they're sin. If we go back to some of those things that we learned, right? The law equals flesh, equals sin, equals death. We have said that the flesh and the spirit are in opposition. And if these are fruits of the flesh, then they are in opposition to the kingdom of God. Of course they wouldn't enter the kingdom of God. And sometimes, sometimes I really forget what sin is. I mean, there's so many definitions of it, right? We can hear things like, well, sin are kind of mistakes that you make. But is that really true? Because mistakes can be covered by grace. I don't really get that. Uh, maybe for some of us, we've heard that the actual like, word of sin is an archery term, like you're aiming for the target, but you sin, meaning you miss the mark. And that could make sense a little bit too. But what we know from, script from Scripture is that sin is a broken relationship with God. But this relationship is vital to our being because we are made with his very breath. And God tells us in Genesis, if you sin, you will die. The wages of sin is death. God is not telling us that, these, that, that this list, that these are sins because we're uh, not obeying him like some shallow, conceited ruler. He's telling us that these things will kill us. They lead to death. And not only that, but eternal death. Sometimes we forget how deep that can really be. And you can actually see, if you look at these two lists, a little bit of the opposition in there. right? If we're looking at the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, which I kind of like more than patience because patience sometimes sounds like just sitting there doing nothing. Forbearance means you've got some wrath, but you're not going to give it. <laughs> I feel like for any parents in the room or people that work with unruly people, which I'm an unruly person, so anyone who works with me, you're like, oh gosh, you know, that's kind of what forbearance is. That's a fruit of the spirit. The spirit is holding you back, right? Awesome. But when you look at some of these things, what are the opposites? What are the things that seem to be opposed to that? Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, envy. It kind of makes sense how these things are opposed to one another. 
But as we look through all these lists, the, the, the thing that keeps striking me is, what do we do with this, though? I mean, in all reality, I can kind of see both of these fruits in my life. And it scares me. What does that mean? Does it mean that I'm not committed to one? How do I move from being someone that is living in the flesh to someone that is living according to the Spirit? Like, there has to be some work that we do, right? We all want the revolution, but we don't want to do the dishes. What are the dishes? What do we got to do? You know, for all of my work in that garden, I am not the reason that the fruit grew. They were already in that seed, Everything that seed needed, everything that seed produced was already in it. I did nothing to make that happen. What I did do was I nurtured and helped provide a place for that seed to grow what was already in it. If you look at verse 22 in this passage, you see the fruit of the Spirit. In the Greek, this is what we call a genitive. The genitive case is used to show ownership. So something is from something or uh, of something. And in this specific nuance of this case, the genitive used is called a genitive of product. So the raw English translation would read, the fruit that is produced by the Spirit. So the first thing that we need to do in order to live according to the Spirit is receive the Spirit. These are fruits from seeds. And who planted that seed? Was it you? It wasn't me. Who's the gardener here? God is. These fruits of the Spirit are from the Spirit, and the Spirit is what was given to you as a follower of Jesus Christ upon believing in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and believing in him as your Lord and Savior. What are you given? You are given the Holy Spirit. So what you need is actually already in you because it's not of you. It's of the Holy Spirit. It is the character and the kingdom of God. Church, hear this. You are set free from sin and death. You don't work for freedom. You work from it. You don't work for love. You work from it. Now, that love might be a little bit weak, might be a tiny plant, but it's growing Everything we need in terms of the fruits that are produced by the Spirit, we have because they're produced by the Spirit. If Paul is really talking about sanctification, what he's really talking about is that sanctification for us in this illustration, it's a garden. The fruits of the Spirit have been planted in us by God. And so our life Sanctification is a journey, an invitation to nurture, to tend these fruits with the one who planted them. And we have to accept this first. Because if we don't acknowledge this, we move into the work before recognizing where it's coming from, and we're making the same mistake that the church in Galatia made. If our work comes out of our faith, not the other way around, our work comes before faith, which is works-based righteousness, which is a fruit of the flesh. So first, first, we have to receive. Think of the songs that we just sang. What can I say? What can I do but just offer this heart completely to you? We did nothing to save ourselves. It was all done by God. And upon believing in him, he plants the seed that is the Holy Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit comes from the Spirit. The first thing we need is a mentality shift. We are not working for the Spirit, people. We're working from the Spirit. You've got this in you because it's not about you. It's about God. It's about what he does. He is the gardener. He is inviting us into nurturing these plants. So after we recognize that, we still need to do dishes. Or in my case, a dishwasher. Someone's got to load it. Someone's got to unload it. 
right? So what exactly is that work? Because we know that faith without works is dead. So we've got the A part down, right? We've got the faith part down. Now we're going to look at what some of these works. What does it mean not to work for our faith, but to nurture what has been planted in us already? I've got a couple things for you. To nurture, to keep in step with the Spirit, this is kind of what he's alliterating to as he's saying that in this passage. To nurture means to nourish, to pull weeds, and to protect. I'm going to go through these, and and then I've got a couple more things because I was raised Baptist. I got three points, I got three more points, and then we're done. All right, here we go. To nurture means to nourish. Those plants that I had, they needed to be watered every day. They need to be fed every day. And sometimes God did it through the sun and the rain. I now understand why farmers and gardeners pray for rain. They're like, let it rain. I don't want to go outside. Just let it rain, right? But most of the time, I had to get my butt up and go grab the hose and water it, right? Reading scripture, prayer, quiet time, worship, songs. You know, um, every church has some form of these, right? And why? Why? Why do we do that stuff up here? Is it like somewhere in scripture where like Jesus told us to? We're like, oh, so it was a command. It's some type of like part of our ritual that we do. These are some of the things that we know from the testimonies of the saints and from Jesus himself nourish what has been planted in us. So the real question about nourishment is what is feeding you? What are, what is providing life? What is providing nourishment? If we have to go and we have to feed ourselves every day, then what are we doing to nourish the seed that has been planted? And when we look at some of these small things, these are some of the examples that we can get. Now, these examples are going to be vague, and they're going to be vague for a purpose, because your soil's not mine. All of us are different types We have different things that um, make us passionate, that motivate us, that get us up, that actually bring us life. One of the things that nourishes my soul is just seeing the ocean. And I have to purposely put that in my my day so I can go look at it. Because for some reason, that tide takes my stress away. I don't know what it is. It's just the way God made me. So I'm not going to tell you to do that because that's me. Right? But what I will give you are a couple of examples and some questions to ask. What is, what are you, what are you eating? What is nourishing you? What is giving you, bringing you life and life from the Spirit? Second, to nurture, to keep in step means to pull weeds. My wife wanted to be sure that I shared the countless hours that we, that she, spent weeding the garden, pulling these weeds. Weeding is insane. You do that all day, and you feel so proud of yourself, and then you show up the next day, and they're just right back up. It is crazy. It is a consistent daily effort. Now, some of the fields we didn't weed, and it showed. The weeds grew, they choked the plants, and no fruit grew. You might have heard a parable about that somewhere, right? I was like, oh, no, it's real. The parable's real. What weeds do you have? What are things that are growing that shouldn't be there? There might be some things in our life that need to be pulled and need to be pulled from the root because if they're not pulled from the root, they're going to grow back easily. And hear this, some of these things will naturally occur. And we have to consistently be on watch and see what needs to be pulled and what doesn't. There are things in our life that should not be there. What is it that is taking the nourishment from the fruit of the Spirit? Lastly, to nurture means to protect. Like I said, the the thing that blew my mind about gardening was sitting in my house at 11 o'clock at night, getting a call from my uh, stepmother-in-law that said, hey, there's going to be a frost tonight. You got to go put your mason jars on these plants. And here I am putting mason jars on plants only to wake up the next day and try to get something and put it in a Tupperware container to discover either the Tupperware container has dirt in it or the Tupperware container is in the dirt. We don't have any more containers. I'm just going to eat with my hands because everything is out there. We had to save. We were like saving all these like ricotta cheese containers, right? We're like, it's for the plants. We got to do it. It was crazy. It was crazy. But it's what needed to happen. 
This, this could sound silly, but listen, there are things that will affect you that aren't a part of you. What boundaries do you have? Are they healthy boundaries? Are they good boundaries? Are they working? Do they need to be readjusted because of the situation that you might find yourself in? The environment can affect us. So if we live in this environment and we are nurturing ourselves, what in our environment could actually be a hazard that we need to protect ourselves from? Now, these are things that we do. Here's something a garden requires. Now, I'm not going to put the law on you, right? But from my experience and from talking to some fellow gardeners, there's a couple of principles that I've seen that can help us in terms of the growth of the spirit that you can choose to do, but if you don't do them, you will be less likely to have something that grows in your faith. Here's something that nurturing requires. Nurturing the fruit of the spirit requires consistency. There's a guy that I follow. He's like a personal trainer of mine. His name is Nick Kumulsatos. He was a former Marine Raider, so he worked Marine Special Operations. Um, super cool guy, and he gives this definition of discipline. In the military, we hear that word discipline all the time. You just need more discipline. Got to be more disciplined. Bah, bah, bah. That's what we talked about, right? That's like the answer for all of the problems. Tires flat, discipline. Fix it, right? That's what you got to do. But, but some of these definitions are random and kind of weird. Here's one that changed my life a little bit. Discipline is consistency in the small, specific areas of my life. Discipline is consistency. Maybe we don't have to ask what all do we do, but what can we do every day? Because to really grow those plants was to get up every day and go put the mason jars down. Go water the field. Go make sure that there's no weeds choking the plants. And we're not talking about motivation here because motivation is not discipline. We're not going to be motivated. This is hard work. If it was easy, we'd all be doing this. We wouldn't need to have a sermon on it. We all would just understand and move on. But we all wrestle and struggle with this and have to try to figure out how do we do it. Well, maybe it's because we're trying to look for some passionate motivation when we should be looking for the consistency in what can we do every day to help nurture what has been planted in us. Now, don't put too much on your plate because that's going to lead to us being burnt out, right? But what can you do every day to help nourish, to help weed, to help protect? Nurturing a garden requires community. Uh, This garden was on our uncle's land. We used our uncle's uh, tractor, and uh, he's the one that set up the irrigation system. We're great on his side, not on our side. I don't know what that means. But it was a big community thing. Megan's parents were the ones that called us to tell us there was a frost. We are not made to be alone. If we are made in the image of God, then we're made in the image of the Trinity. The Trinity is community. We are made for community. We're actually called the family of God. In our Apostles' Creed, we affirm the communion of the saints. It's a very similar word to what we're about to experience, right? That's how intertwined we are. We need each other. You're not supposed to be doing this alone, and you shouldn't. You should be asking for help. You should be asking for someone to come alongside you. It's important. In this case, it's required. Finally, nurturing a garden requires grace. So my story up here might sound like the first time my wife and I did a garden, we were just so on point. We had this bountiful harvest and everything worked great. Um, There was a great harvest. Uh, It was from Uncle Paul's part of the land. (laughs) There was little to nothing that my wife and I could eat. I was talking to her about this and I was like, "But, but babe, we had so many cucumbers. We ate so many cucumbers. We turned them into pickles. I love pickles. Love pickles. Serious moment. And I was so excited about that. She was like, Kevin, those were Paul's pickles. That was not, was not ours. But the cool thing was we just kind of laughed at it. Because we had never done a garden before. Why did we think that we would do well? If you've never done this before, why do you think you're going to be good at it? Of course you're not going to be good at it. Guys, life happens. Most of these things are beyond our control. We can nurture as good as we want, but some of the seeds just didn't grow. Sometimes it might not even be the season for bearing fruit. 
Or we might grow something and realize we don't want to grow that. Stuff happens. God is not asking us to get it right every time. He just asks us to stay with him, to keep in step, to learn and grow. Because that's actually part of the whole process of sanctification. These seeds are produced by the Spirit. What you need for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control is already in you because Christ is in you. Live from that, not for that. Nurture yourself. Nurture others. Do not, let us not, my prayer for us is to not become a community like the, like the churches in Galatia that were biting and devouring one another. Rather, we stir each other on to, to good deeds. Rather, we help nurture, we help protect, we help grow, and the fruit of the Spirit produces more fruit. This is the imagery and the joy of the kingdom of God. It is his, and it's what he's doing. He is inviting us into it. Let us not try to work for that. Let us join in and work from it. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, you are so good, and I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the opportunity for us to be here and hear your word. Jesus Christ, you are the reason why we can say that we are a child of God. You are the one who has fulfilled us, who has saved us, who has made things right. And you promise that this is the work that you start and you will bring it to completion. May our faith be in that and not ourselves. We work with you, God, not for you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kevin. You know, that idea of, of nurturing the soil and consistency and community and grace, it's found at the table. That every week we come to the table and we have this physical, tangible experience where we are holding the elements and engaging all our senses, consistently reminding ourselves as a community of God's grace. So as we take and we eat and we pray over these elements, this is one of those things where we, we till the soil, we pull the weeds, we protect ourselves, we immerse ourselves and the grace of Christ. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup. It was the cup of the new covenant in his blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And whenever we drink from the cup and we eat from the bread, we proclaim Jesus' death. We proclaim that Jesus has ascended. We proclaim that the Holy Spirit has come to us and is in us. And as Kevin has reminded us, the seed is in us. The fruit of the Spirit is in us. Thanks be to God. And now we get to participate until that soil, until he returns. So, Father, thank you for the bread. Thank you for the cup. You said, Father, when, when we gather to do this in remembrance of you. And so, Father, in the consistency of remembering this, these signs and symbols that point to your grace and mercy, Lord, and the consistency of that, doing that not by ourselves, but doing it together as a community, as a household of faith, resting on your grace. Lord, would you even now or to be growing seeds, pulling weeds, protecting us. We pray all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, by grace through faith, I invite you to eat and to drink now.
Receive the benediction as you go today. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today. Amen.